In this video, I express only my views as an experienced investor. I'm not being paid by anyone to say anything. My sole motive is education. I'm creating this video because I see a major activity increase in online retail brokerages, places that appeal to small stock market investors. These websites encourage investors to make many small transactions as though the stock market is a video game where you get ahead by making rapid moves, sometimes daily. But stocks aren't a video game, and the most reliable way to lose money in stocks is to churn your portfolio. For self-serving reasons, the online brokerages do all they can to encourage frequent small transactions because that's how they make money at your expense. But first I need to set the stage. I need to explain the key to getting ahead with any investment. And that key is, wait for it, compound interest. Without a grasp of compound interest, effective investment strategies won't make sense and the outcomes will make even less sense. Here's my favorite compound interest explainer, which some of my loyal fans will recognize. Welcome to Anytown, USA, a town whose population increases by 1% per year. How long will it take for any town's population to double? Well, simple algebra tells us that 1% per year times 100 years should double the population. If the population increases 1% per year in 100 years, it should have exactly doubled. Doesn't that sound right? Well, in this case, common sense fails us. That analysis is wrong. It assumes a linear process and overlooks something important. The reason it's wrong is because children have children of their own and their children have children ad infinitum. Consequently, as time passes, the 1% growth rate is applied to an increasing and reproducing population, an effect called compounding. Population growth is an example of an exponential growth process in which a fixed rate of change is applied to a changing quantity. Compounding problems appear in population studies, bank accounts, investments, any problem with an interaction between a population and a growth rate. This, by the way, is one of the first important life lessons that requires a little calculus knowledge. This video's description includes a link to my calculus introduction video. In this population problem, because of compound growth, the town's population doubles in only 70 years, and in 100 years it will have increased by 171% over its original size. In 200 years, the population increases to over 600% of its original size. In 400 years, it increases over 5,000%. All these outcomes result from a modest 1% annual population increase. Here's another example where compound interest forces a non-intuitive outcome. Let's say, at an early age, you inherit an investment fund from a rich uncle. We should all be so lucky. The investment starting balance is 100000 with a 10% growth rate per year. The plan is to withdraw a monthly dividend from the account in a way that doesn't erode the account's balance. Here's a chart that shows the account's changing balance over 50 years for different withdrawal amounts. If you withdraw $833.33 per month, the account balance doesn't change. After 50 years, you still have $100,000. But if you withdraw $577 more per month, a change of less than 1%, after 50 years, the account is empty. If you withdraw $577 less, the account doubles in value. Think about this. By making a tiny increase in your monthly dividend, over 50 years, you drain the account. If instead you withdraw a tiny bit less, the account doubles in value, all because of the amplifying effect of compound interest. Remember this amplifying effect for a later discussion of stockbrokers and investment fees. So, compound interest amplifies small differences over time, both positive and negative differences. This is one reason rich people become richer and poor people become poorer. It's not the only reason. Rich people with well-managed investments become richer over time. Poor people who have debts they can't retire become poorer over time. Over years and decades, compound interest amplifies in both directions and drives people apart, first economically, then socially. Here's a famous quote on this topic, but I have to say it was part of a story Hemingway wrote. It wasn't an actual conversation between Fitzgerald and Hemingway.
Let's say you've gotten to the point where you have some money set aside, something north of $1,000, and you want to know how to invest it. A bank savings account is a non-starter because available interest rates are well below the inflation rate, so that's out. Real estate might seem attractive, but there are some serious drawbacks not obvious at first glance. Remember that the 2008 economic meltdown was triggered by a wave of subprime mortgage defaults on properties that, because of the mortgage crisis itself, suddenly had less value than the cost of their loans. Cryptocurrencies are another non-starter. They're much too volatile, and some will argue they're not real money anyway. This may change in the future, but for the present, caution is advised. Given the alternatives, the stock market is a good choice, as long as you know how to get in without being taken in. Over the past 40 years, the S&P 500 stock market index grew about 9.5% per annum. The Dow Jones market index showed a similar return over that time, but economists anticipate lower overall market returns in the future, a topic to which I shall return. This quick summary points to the stock market as a good investment compared to the alternatives, but there are some pitfalls new investors need to avoid. When you visit a doctor, it helps to know something about medicine and to make healthy choices, but you don't need to be a doctor yourself. When you board an airliner, it helps to know airline policies and practices, but you don't need to personally fly the airplane. But unlike most life activities, when you invest your money, you do need to fly the airplane. You need to be at the controls and know what keeps the airplane flying. If you don't, if instead you hire financial counselors and brokers and take their advice, studies show the average investor's returns fall well below published market growth rates. Put very simply, a pilot's job is to take you home. A doctor's job is to take your temperature and your pulse. A stockbroker's job is to take your money. To solve this problem, to avoid the unnatural burden imposed by stockbrokers and financial advisors, take Warren Buffett's advice and invest in something called an index fund, a special fund that normally has very small fees and simply tracks a market index like the Standard & Poor's 500 or the Dow Jones Index. The reason an index fund keeps up with the market average is because it is the market average. Such a fund is composed of the same stocks the index tracks. And if you choose the right fund, there are little or no management fees because there's nothing to manage. Another advantage of an index fund is that it's more stable and balanced than a typical investment portfolio because it consists of a wide assortment of stocks from different market sectors. If windmills and solar panels eat into coal and oil profits, you don't suffer because the index fund covers both sectors. If electric cars kill demand for gas-powered cars, you don't suffer because the index fund includes both. Not surprisingly, stockbrokers and financial advisors have ingenious but self-serving arguments against index funds. Here are some claims made by the professionals to justify their services. Hiring a professional will assure better returns than managing your own portfolio. The Wall Street Journal decided to test this claim. For 14 years, they ran their now-famous dartboard contest. In the contest, Wall Street Journal reporters threw darts at a list of stocks and track the price of the stocks the darts hit by chance. Over the years, the professional's picks came out a bit ahead of the dartboard stock list, but this likely resulted from the so-called announcement effect. It turns out the Wall Street Journal published the picks of the professionals, and readers reacted by bidding up the price of those particular stocks. This gave the pros an artificial advantage. But at the end of the 14-year contest and overall, the professional's performance was about the same as random picks, but if brokerage fees, sales commissions, and the tax implications of frequent trades are taken into account, the pros fell well behind market indices. Here's another claim made by industry insiders. Professionals know investment secrets that give them higher than average returns. Well, point one, there's no evidence for this. Statistical studies repeatedly show that, on average, managed investment accounts fall behind market indices, because of bad choices or added costs or both. Point two, if there really was some secret sauce that could consistently, reliably create higher than average returns, the secret would come out, everyone would practice it, and that would become the new market average, the same average that index funds track. This is because nothing stays secret for long. 
with the possible exception of where Jimmy Hoffa is buried and why people buy pet rocks. Point three. If stockbrokers really had special knowledge that could create a higher than average rate of return, they wouldn't need your money to stay solvent. They could become independently wealthy by investing their own money. But for some reason, even though they're investment experts, they need your money to stay afloat. Something is rotten in Denmark. Point four. If these investment secrets come from insider information not available to the public, be very careful. Trading on insider information is illegal and is aggressively prosecuted. In the big picture, brokerage fees are small, not very important. Oh, on the contrary. Remember the amplifying effect of compound interest. Typical brokerage fees are 1-2% to of a client's portfolio. For this example, I use 2% to account for the less obvious drawbacks to having a managed account, like the tax implications of frequent trades, and the additional burden of sales commissions, which are often concealed from the investor. For the market itself, I chose a growth figure of 7%, consistent with recent trends and the study quoted earlier. In these examples, we compare a no-fee index fund that yields 7% per year against a managed account that yields 5% because of brokerage costs and accompanying losses. In the one-year chart, the index fund comes out ahead by 2%. Not surprising. In five years, the index fund pulls ahead to 11%. This shows the amplifying effect of compound interest. In 10 years, the index fund is ahead by 22%. In 20 years, it's ahead by 49%. In 40 years, 123%. And in 60 years, the no-load index fund comes out ahead by 231%, more than twice the value of the brokered account. This comparison makes the assumption that, before imposing fees, commissions, and extra taxes, the brokered account performs as well as an index fund, which, according to studies, most brokered accounts cannot do. So this is an optimistic comparison. Okay, let's say you decide to avoid stockbrokers and financial advisors and manage your own funds. But if you maintain an active stock portfolio and make frequent trades on your own, on average, you will still fall behind market indices. This is true for many reasons. One, individual investors trade too much, so sales commissions eat up profits. Two, individual investors are notorious for buying and selling at the wrong times. They act on emotion, then buy high and sell low. About this, Warren Buffett says, Tax-paying investors will realize a far, far greater sum from a single investment that compounds internally at a given rate than from a succession of investments compounding at the same rate. Investopedia says, you may be able to beat the market, but with investment fees, taxes, and human emotion working against you, you're more likely to do so through luck than skill. If you can merely match the S&P 500 minus a small fee, you'll be doing better than most investors. There are now many online investment websites, but remember, these sites can only make money if they get you to buy and sell stocks, and the more trades, the better. Some sites make stock investment seem like a computer game, encouraging constant transactions to try to get ahead. This behavior has attracted the attention of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which has charged Robinhood Financial with misstatements and for misleading investors about fees. Robinhood was required to pay a $65 million civil judgment, which I suspect represented a small percentage of their monthly gross income from victims, uh, I mean naive investors. This is just one example picked at random. There are many similar accounts. To make sense of all this, you should ask yourself why you want to invest in stocks. Do you want drama and excitement, or do you want to make money? I ask because you can't have both. Retail investing is exciting, but the average investor will fall well behind someone who acquires an index fund and waits patiently for higher returns. Stock investing is like tending a garden. You plant seeds, then step back and wait for results, patiently. Your investment garden must be allowed to grow on its own without interference. If instead you periodically tear up your garden and plant new seeds, the yield drops dramatically. Let's explore a classic market prediction scenario. Here's a chart that tracks the daily fluctuations of an imaginary stock market. The red trace shows the market's daily index over 30 years. Now, I add a polynomial regression to smooth out the fluctuations in the raw data. That's the green line. 
Now I use the regression line data to mark price reversals. Those are the vertical red and blue lines. I know that any time the market's overall price changes direction, I could act on that knowledge. On the dates marked in red, I would sell. On the dates marked in blue, I would buy. Simple, huh? But there's one problem. You can only identify market reversals after the fact. And for big reversals like the one at about 19 years on this chart, some time must pass before you know how big the reversal is going to be. And by then, it's too late to act on it. That's why I call them post-dictions, because they can only be detected after the fact. Many market beginners don't understand this limitation, and unfortunately there are scammers who exploit their ignorance, who pretend to be able to forecast market trends using secret market insider sources of information. Most people think they can detect a scam when they see one, and in most circumstances that's probably true. But investing is far enough from everyday life to be a special case. Unethical stockbrokers can and do engage in outright trickery to deceive even educated people. Do you think you're too skeptical, too cautious, to fall for a stock market scam? Let's see. Here's a classic scam called, wait for it, Miracle, Miracle Man. Man. I'll describe the scam, then explain it. See if you can figure out how it works before I explain it. Here we go. On May 1st, you receive an email from Miracle Man. The message makes a firm prediction that the market will either rise or fall in the next month. The prediction is not about a few stocks, but the entire market. During the month of May, you notice that the market either rose or fell, exactly as Miracle Man predicted in advance. On June 1st, you get another Miracle Man email with another prediction, and during the month following, you see it also turns out to be exactly right. The same pattern repeats for six months. In his emails, Miracle Man predicts the direction of the entire stock market weeks in advance and he is always right. You realize that if you had acted on his predictions, you would have become rich. On October 1st, you get a final email with another accurate prediction, but in this message, Miracle Man correctly points out that if you had followed his advice, you would have made millions, and he asks for control of your portfolio. I emphasize again that this is a scam, a trick. It doesn't rely on insider information or any special knowledge of the stock market. How does Miracle Man do it? How can anyone predict the entire market for six months straight with perfect reliability? Before I reveal how this scam works, here are some general points an intelligent skeptical person should consider when confronted by a seemingly miraculous appeal like this. If someone could predict stocks with perfect accuracy, he could drain the market of its capital and become absurdly rich. But if the market could be drained this way, businesses would refuse to raise funds using stocks, and the market would collapse. The market hasn't collapsed, so something is rotten in Denmark. If Miracle Man could really predict the market with perfect accuracy, he could become rich using his own funds, or he could talk billionaires into following his tips. He wouldn't be sending you emails asking for access to your little piggy bank, so again, something is rotten in Denmark. The Miracle Man scam doesn't use insider information to work, but a general word of advice. Anyone who claims to have special knowledge of the market may be using insider information to get ahead, and if you follow their advice, you might be prosecuted for insider trading. So be careful with market advice that comes your way. If you hear a hot stock tip that's not also in a newspaper or online, don't trade on it. Okay, now for the reveal. Here's how Miracle Man works. First, Miracle Man gets hold of a very large address list, easily acquired online. Ideally, the list length should be a power of two, for a reason that will become obvious. Next, Miracle Man divides the list in two and gives each group of recipients an opposite prediction. The market will rise or the market will fall. He sends the emails. After a month has passed, Miracle Man throws away half the addresses, those that got a wrong prediction and divides the remaining list in two, and starts over. For six months, Miracle Man repeats the process, each time throwing away half the addresses. This means a very large address list becomes very small, but those recipients have gotten a seemingly miraculous run of accurate market forecasts. Unless they're very skeptical, those few may want to give Miracle Man control of their portfolios. Okay, 
Did you figure out how this works before the reveal? Most people don't, mostly because people aren't skeptical enough or trained in game theory and logic. Here's another reveal. Point one, the stock market cannot be predicted in a way that would allow an honest person to consistently and reliably beat market averages. Point two, the market's unpredictability is proof of its overall fairness. A predictable market would be unfair to people excluded from the prediction, and that's why insider trading is illegal. Point three, the market's unpredictability is why people with index funds do better than the average active trader. Now for the task of choosing an index fund. I said at the start that I wasn't being paid by anyone, and apart from recommending index funds as an investment, I don't intend to be too specific. Here are some suggestions. In choosing an index fund, look for a fund that tracks a major market index like the Standard & Poor's 500 Index or the Dow Jones Index. Avoid derivative index funds, meaning funds that don't track all the stocks in a market index, unless you have a good reason. Then examine the fund's details for key desirable traits. Here's an example online chart I acquired by entering a stock code into Google's online search engine. I removed identifying information from the chart to avoid seeming to promote any specific fund for two reasons. One, I don't intend to recommend any specific fund. And two, good quality index funds are much the same. They follow the same indices and most have low expense ratios so there's little reason to favor one over another. If you want to use this method to evaluate a fund, enter its stock code into Google or another search engine and read the provided information. In particular, select chart options to show a five-year or longer growth curve, as in my example. Obviously, past performance can't be used to predict the future, but it may give a rough sense of the fund's behavior over time. Notice the items along the bottom of the chart, in particular the front load and the expense ratio. A desirable index fund should have little or no front load and a small expense ratio as shown in this example. The expense ratio should be small to reflect the fact that index funds require little or no management over time. In the event of a large purchase, some funds may waive the front load, but this should be researched in advance. The morning star rating at the lower right may provide useful guidance if you take the time to research what the rating means. For comparison, here's a five-year chart for the Standard & Poor's 500 Market Index, which shows that my example fund, which was designed to track this index, matches its growth almost exactly. But I emphasize that you should learn enough about equities to be able to choose an index fund using your own knowledge. Remember from my prior examples that you're piloting your own financial airplane. And again, avoid online brokerages to the degree possible. They have a terrible reputation. Here's a recent news story in which the Securities and Exchange Commission warns against engaging with online brokerages, which do all in their power to make equities investments seem like a video game with many fast moves, each of which reduces your profit and increases theirs. Let me address a related topic, credit cards. In my opinion, one of the most corrosive and destabilizing financial schemes ever invented. For various reasons, in modern society, having a credit card is essential. But the interest rates charged on credit card debt would probably be illegal in any other context, sometimes as high as 35% for cards offered to people with poor credit ratings. That's right, the very people least able to afford high interest rates. I have one credit card. I never have more than one. My bank automatically pays the balance on the card every month, so I never have an overdue balance and I pay no interest. This means I get a free 30-day loan on purchases I make with the card. How can a bank issue me a free card and loan me money every month but charge no interest? That's easy to answer. The credit card system is paid for by poor people who do pay interest and other fees they can't afford. If you have an unpaid balance on your credit card, please think about this. The interest payments you make that you cannot afford go into the pockets of rich people who don't need the money. Your credit card charges are paying for some rich person's yacht. Unlike COVID-19, for this disease the cure is simple. Never run an overdue balance on your credit card. It's joke time! Near the end of my videos I normally tell one joke from my secret stash of pretty good jokes. Here goes! 
a doctor calls his patient. Mr. Jones, I have some good news and some bad news. Mr. Jones says, huh, tell me the good news first. The doctor says, the good news is you have 24 hours to live. Mr. Jones says, wait, what? I have 24 hours to live? And that's the good news. Wh what's the bad news? The doctor says, uh, okay, I forgot to call you yesterday. I hope you found this video educational and entertaining. Don't fall for Miracle, Miracle Man, Man and please like and subscribe.